So, dear colleagues, uh, we start our seminar today, and today our guest is uh, Dr. Richard Roberts, uh, who is Nobel Prize winner, and he asked to present him rather briefly. Currently, he is a Chief Scientific Officer at New England Biolabs, Ipswich, Massachusetts. He received a PhD in organic chemistry in 1968 from Sheffield University and then moved as a postdoctoral fellow to Harvard. He worked at Cold Spring Carver Laboratory, eventually becoming assistant director for the research under Dr. Watson. He began work on the newly discovered type two restriction enzymes in 1972. In 1975, he became the first employer of New England Biolabs, first as the chief consultant, and later moved to the company permanently in 1992. His studies of transcription of adenovirus 2 led to the discovery of split genes and uh, mRNA splicing in 1977, for which he received the Nobel Prize in Medicine. Since winning the Nobel Prize, Dr. Roberts has been involved in organizing a number of Nobel initiatives to correct scientific misunderstandings and promote humanitarian causes. He most, uh, his most recent campaign has been on the issue of GMOs, where the 160 Nobel laureates have supported the use of GMO technique to improve plant bearing practices that could greatly help the developing countries. And dear Dr. Richard Roberts, please, you can start your lecture. Okay, well, thank you. I'm sorry, we're a little late um, due to some small it's technical fine. difficulties on my side. Can you hear me okay now? Yes. Yeah, good. Okay, so what I'm going to do today is to talk about the path that I took that led to the Nobel Prize. And I hope to talk to you about some of the things that really made a difference that I hope will persuade you that you too can make a difference by doing things a little differently from the way that many people do them. Now, I was born in England. <clears throat> uh -oh, what's happening here? Okay, I was born in England in the town of Derby, um, which is shown on the left side in the middle of England. And it was during the war in 1943, and the Germans um, were trying to do to us what the Russians are trying to do to you at the moment. And it turned out that where I lived in Derby was very close to the Rolls-Royce factory, where the RAF were busy making the planes that were necessary in order to go over and bomb Germany. I was lucky because it turned out the street I lived on <clears throat> was right on the flight path between Germany and the Rolls-Royce factory, with the result that one side of the street on which I live got bombed quite heavily, but the side on which I lived, fortunately, did not get bombed. And so thanks to that, I'm here to talk to you today. Now, when I was four years old, my parents moved to Bath, shown on the right-hand side, the circled um, town. If ever you ever get to go to England and have a chance to visit a beautiful town, um, I can say you should think about Bath. It really is a very, very beautiful town um, and it's very easy to get to from London. So at four years old, I went to school. I started going to school to a little um, small school, very close to where I lived. And then by 1950, when I was seven, I went to St. Stephen's School um, shown here. And this is a very small school. There were basically four classes in it, um, one for seven-year-olds, one for eight, one for nine, one for 10. During that time, I had a very interesting experience and one that for me, um, I think was really transformative. When I used to leave the school at the end of the day, the headmaster used to come up and give me puzzles to do, little mathematical puzzles. And as a result of that, I fell in love with mathematics. And that is something that has stayed with me throughout my career. I really love math. I like the logic that goes with math. And it was all because of this headmaster at this um, school. And so fortunately, when I won the Nobel Prize, he was still alive and I was able to contact him and tell him what a difference he had made in my life. So that was very good in the early days. 
Now, this is an aerial view of some parts of Bath. <clears throat> On the left-hand side is the Roman Bath. The city had been discovered by the Romans um, because it, were, it had hot springs. There were people living there next to the hot springs. And the Romans decided that they were going to build some baths there. And they still exist today. They date back 2,000 years. And I've actually, when I was young, I swam in the bath at one point. They're closed now to the public, but um, the main bath there was open at a time. Now, by the time I reached the age of 11, I'd read a book, and it was a book about how I became a detective and a regular detective, someone who was solving crimes and so on. And I just loved it. I absolutely loved this book. And by the time I finished it, I decided I was going to be a detective. This was what I was going to do with my life. My parents, oh, I should say, I, I really love puzzles, not just mathematical ones, but all sorts. But I was curious about all sorts of things. And my parents were very supportive of this. We didn't have any money. We were a, a very poor family. Uh, but nevertheless, my parents supported me every way that they could. And when I was 11, my father bought a chemistry set. And one of these ones that you buy for kids to sort of encourage them. And in those days, you could do a lot of very interesting things with these chemistry sets. And I discovered you could make fireworks and explosives. And I fell in love with chemistry. And so I abandoned plans to be a detective and decided that I was going to be a chemist instead. And I read a lot of books. And when I was 11, I, we have an exam you take in England at the time called the 11 plus to find out what senior school you're going to go to, what high school you're going to go to. And I went to a school called the City of Bath Boys School. It was a grammar school, so sort of the top school that you could get to. And when I was there, we had a very good math teacher and I increased my love for math. I learned to play the violin and join the school orchestra, which I enjoyed very much. But something else that happened to me that was quite important was that we lived very close to a set of limestone hills called the Mendips. Um, you've probably heard of cheddar cheese and cheddar gorge is a part of the Mendips. And this is where they made the original cheddar cheese and still do. And I became very interested in going underground in going caving and love caving and went collecting bugs while I was down. There are a lot of interesting organisms that live in these caves. And a friend and I used to go down and collect bugs and send them off to a place where they would identify them and figure out what was what. I also discovered jazz during that time because Bath became quite famous for jazz. We had a big jazz festival every year. And so that was good too. So I widened my interest. I, I had lots of interests other than just, you know, the regular schoolwork. Now, in 1962, I had continued to do the chemistry. I might say that one year, uh, when I was 18, I almost got thrown out of school because I stopped going. I got very bored with school. Um, and I actually failed the advanced level exams that you had to take to go to university in the first year. And I concentrated fairly hard. I failed physics. I didn't like physics. We had a rotten teacher. Uh, but anyway, I, I managed to pass it the second year. But that meant that I had to find another university to go to, and I applied to Sheffield, and they took me. I also applied to Southampton University, which had a good chemistry department, but they, they didn't take me. Anyway, I got to Sheffield, and I started to pursue a career in research. And in 1965, I got my BSc, and then stayed on to do my PhD with Professor Ollis, who was the head of chemistry at the time. And he had a very interesting way of teaching chemistry. And that was to really make it a, a, a question of how do you solve problems? And so the exams, he, he would give an exam and say, well, what you have to do is you've gotten these results. You did this experiment. You got this result. You did this experiment. You got this result. What does that experiment tell you? And in this case, it was usually trying to figure out what the compound was. Um, that the people were looking at. And it, it was good. I loved it because chemistry all of a sudden um, seemed much like logic, mathematics, 
And also it was a chance to be a detective and solve chemical puzzles in the world of science. So everything that, had, that I loved when I was a kid all came together at once. And so that was very nice. Now, when I was uh, doing my PhD, I ran into this gentleman called Kazu Kurosawa. And he was the a postdoc in the lab, in, in um, David Ollis's lab. And I was in with him and he became my real mentor in Sheffield, uh, much more so than the professor. It was Kazu who really taught me how to think about chemistry, how to do experiments. And he had the beautiful gift that when he would tell you what you should do, um, he would tell you why you were doing it and how to interpret the results of the experiments. And he was, he was just an incredible part of my life when I was doing my PhD. He also loved games and he taught me how to play Go, the game on the bottom left, um, which is very interesting. It's more complicated than chess and a game that I used to play regularly for a long time. In fact, Kazu and I used to play by mail for um, quite a number of years until his English got so bad and I, it was obvious he was having trouble writing the letters to uh, accomplish the moves. But anyway, I met him a few years ago when I took this photograph and met him and his family and, and we had a wonderful reunion. Now, when he left Sheffield, I was still there as a graduate student. And it turned out that after the first year, thanks to Kazu, I really had all of the results that I needed for my PhD. I, I could have written my thesis there and then, but you have to do three years if you're going to do a PhD in the UK. And so I had two years to go. So I spent one year um, sort of playing around and, and doing some things that I thought might be interesting, but didn't really get anywhere. <clears throat> but what I did do, I started going over to the library and I started to read about things other than chemistry, things that chemistry might lead to. And I also attended a number of lectures thinking about things other than chemistry. And I came across this book called The Thread of Life by John Kendrew. Now, Kendrew was a Nobel Prize winner. He was one of the first people to determine the structure of a protein. And the book, The Thread of Life, was really a history of the origins of molecular biology. And just like when I read the book about how I became a detective, when I read The Thread of Life, by the end of that, book, I knew I wanted to be a molecular biologist. I didn't want to do chemistry anymore. I wanted to get into the biological realm. And it was, it was really wonderful. It was a great book, read lots more about molecular biology. And then when it came time to apply for a postdoc, I applied to about half a dozen labs, all of which were doing molecular biology, but sort of the interface between chemistry and molecular biology. I didn't think I could just go and become a molecular biologist immediately. So I applied to six places to do a postdoc, but only one person took me. And that person was Jack Strominger. Um, he was at the time at Wisconsin. And I imagine when he accepted me as a graduate student, he was the only one who did, when he accepted me, I thought I would be going to Wisconsin to do my postdoc. But about two months before I was scheduled to come over to the US to work with him, he wrote and said, could I delay for two months? Because he was just moving to Harvard. He'd just been made a full professor at Harvard University, which turned out to be his lifelong ambition to be a professor at Harvard. And so I said, sure, stayed on in Sheffield for a couple of months. And then on January 1st, 1969, I flew with my family at the time. I had a wife and two children, uh, two young children. One, one of the, my kids was 16 months and the other one was three months. We flew to Boston and I took a postdoc at Harvard. And during that time, I really discovered so many interesting things about biology, about molecular biology, things that one might hope to do, things that one shouldn't do. Um, I was put under the control of another postdoc, a guy called Tom Stewart, who was from Australia. And he'd been working for several years 
on a transfer RNA. Um, these are the RNA molecules that transfer amino acids into proteins on the ribosome. And there was a tRNA glycine that was actually involved not in protein synthesis, but it was specialized for bacterial cell wall biosynthesis. Turns out a lot of bacteria have a cell wall in which they have a, a compound called peptidoglycan. It's a big polymer, and it is cross-linked with glycine or serine or other things. Anyway, in Staphylococcus epidermis, the cross-link was a glycine, polyglycine, and there was a tRNA responsible for doing it. And my postdoctoral project was to work out the sequence of tRNA glycine. Well, Tom Stewart had been doing it by a rather old fashioned method, um, one that actually had been awarded a Nobel Prize, but nevertheless was not the best way to do it. And I started to read the literature and discovered that there was a man called Fred Sanger who had come up, he worked in England, and he had come up with a method for sequencing RNAs that we, was using P32. And it was a very good way of doing it. Um, it worked really well. And it was a, an awful lot easier in principle to do it than it was to um, do it by the way that I'd been taught. So I wrote to Fred and asked if I could go and spend some time in his lab and learn his techniques. And he said, sure, come over. And so I went over and I spent six weeks in his lab learning how to sequence RNA. Now, one of the interesting things about Fred Sanger is he was one of the few people who won two Nobel Prizes. He won one Nobel Prize for sequencing protein and one for sequencing DNA, which he shared with Wally Gilbert. Now, he also developed all of the methodology for sequencing RNA and could equally have won a third one for RNA sequencing. But I guess the Nobel Foundation don't like to give three. They're even a little loath to give two. But anyway, they, um, they, they did give it to him for, for the DNA sequencing work. Anyway, so I went over to his lab, learned how to sequence RNA, and then spent some time when I got back to Harvard setting up a lab that Jack Strominger fortunately had the money to pay for that we could use to make DNA, to make RNA sequences, learn how to sequence RNA. And at the time, it turned out by chance, I was the first person in the Boston area who was busy sequencing RNA and knew Fred's methods. And so a lot of people came to me to learn how to do it. And that was very nice. I, I met an awful lot of interesting people during that time and figured out how to sequence RNA and taught many people. Now, what happened during that time was one of the people that I worked with, or two of the people, were Tom Maniartis and Mark Potashny. And Mark Potashny, who was an assistant professor at Harvard at the time, um, working in Jim Watson's group, came up to me after a seminar one day and said, um, Jim Watson, Watson of Watson and Crick fame, Crick and Watson fame, um, was interested in hiring someone to sequence SV40 DNA down at Cold Spring Harbor. And he said, he, Jim is going to come and talk to you about this because he thinks you might be a, a good candidate to uh, work down there. And so I waited. I'd never met Jim Watson. I didn't know him. And it turned out, of course, he didn't know me. And after a couple of weeks, Mark says, well, Jim doesn't actually know who you are. Perhaps you can go and introduce yourself. So I did, I went over and introduced myself. And I think maybe spent 10 minutes in his office, um, during which he offered me a position at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. And the idea was that I would sequence the DNA of SV40. And at the time, the standard method for sequencing DNA was not the methods we use today, but rather to copy it into RNA and then sequence the RNA. And so that's what I did. I went down to Cold Spring Harbor. Um, Jim, actually, there was an amusing story. I, at the time, I, I was rather an impoverished postdoc. I didn't have a lot of money. And I had one decent set of clothes, which I wore to uh, go down and interview, as it were. Um, but it was a rainy day. Jim um, insisted on walking me around the grounds. And I ended up being covered in mud up to my knees as a result of this experience. 
uh, when it came time to give my talk. But anyway, it, it all worked out and he offered me a job. However, I didn't like the fact that there were already two groups trying to sequence SV40 DNA, one at Yale and one in Ghent in Belgium. And it seemed to me that this was not something I wanted to do. I, I just didn't want to, um, you know, compete with these two other people. I, I like to do my own thing and I don't like a lot of competition. And before I went down there, I went and listened to a talk by the man in the top left, Dan Nathans, who shared the Nobel Prize with Werner Arbor and Hamilton Smith for the discovery of restriction enzymes. And when I went to Cold Spring Harbor in 1972, it seemed to me that there was an alternative way to think about sequencing DNA. And one of the reasons that RNA was, the methods were developed first, was that there were lots of small molecules to practice on. And so it was very easy to find tRNAs, to find small 5S RNAs and so on, things that were small where you could develop methods easily. But with DNA, all the DNA molecules were huge. But this enzyme called endonuclease R, which we now call Hindi 2, this enzyme cut DNA into very specific pieces because it was recognizing very short sequences. And because of this, you could really cut SV40 DNA into some pieces, a number of which were quite small. And it occurred to me if you could do that, and if there were more of these enzymes, then you could cut DNA rather easily into small manageable fragments and use them to sequence DNA. And so I started looking. And we looked in a, a collection of bacteria that I'd brought down with me from Harvard, from when I'd been working in Jack Strominger's lab. And everywhere we looked, we found these enzymes. And soon my lab had a huge collection of them. And during the 70s and 80s, about 75 of the known type 2 enzymes, of which there were about 100, were isolated in my lab at Cold Spring Harbor. Now, Jim, when he heard, Jim Watson, when he heard I was doing this, was not very happy because he'd hired me to sequence SV40. And we weren't really making any progress on sequencing because these enzymes turned out to be just way more interesting and also way more useful. And so um, a lot of people used to come to Cold Spring Harbor for meetings and they would bring with them DNA in a test tube and they'd sneak out of the meeting, come down to my lab and ask if I had a restriction enzyme that was able to cut their DNA. And the answer was usually we could find something that was useful to them. Um, we would give them a sample of the enzyme and if they wanted to make it themselves, we'd give them the strain and tell them how to make it. And it soon became apparent that there was actually a business possibility here, that one could start a business selling these restriction enzymes because it turned out everybody wanted them. This was at the time of the start of the recombinant DNA technology revolution. And, you know, it was really the starting point for the biotechnology industry. So anyway, so I went to Jim and I said, look, why don't we start a company associated with Cold Spring Harbor, will sell these enzymes and use the profits to support the research at Cold Spring Harbor. So instead of applying for grants, we would use money that we could make from this company. Well, Jim Watson wasn't interested. He said he didn't think this was a good idea. He didn't think that we could make any money doing it. It would distract us from the real research that was necessary at Cold Spring Harbor. And he just wanted nothing to do with it. But I knew that there was a possibility here. And so I started to look around and I ran into a man called Don Cohn up in Boston. And I'll tell you more about him later on and New England Biolabs where I now work. But anyway, I continued um, at Cold Spring Harbor, but as a result of Jim not being very happy with the fact that I wasn't sequencing SV40 DNA, he was constantly fighting with me, constantly threatening to fire me. But fortunately, I ran into a man called Norton Zinder, shown here on the right. And he and I are at a Cold Spring Harbor meeting, but we actually met on a train going to Ghent to a meeting about restriction enzymes. 
And Norton had also discovered a restriction enzyme in a system he was working on. He was a geneticist. And he became a very good friend. And he was actually also Jim Watson's friend, maybe Jim Watson's only friend. Uh, but every time that Jim threatened to fire me, Norton would step in and convince Jim that, well, he should let me stay. So that was really something that was, again, very important. And I think it gives you a good idea of how important it is to get to know people. Um, you know, scientific friends can be incredibly helpful for many different kinds of things. <clears throat> now, during the time when we were looking for restriction enzymes, some of these restriction enzymes were being used at Cold Spring Harbor to map adenovirus 2 DNA. Now, adenovirus 2 is a eukaryotic virus. It infects humans, and you have symptoms rather similar to a cold. You typically get infected when you're very young. Your mother thought you had a cold, and she gives you lots of hugs and lots of warmth, and you get over it and you become immune, you never have another problem with it. And so this was a very nice, ad, uh, uh, nice virus to work with in the lab. And it was a project in which Phil Sharp was also involved and Phil eventually shared the Nobel Prize with me, but that's a separate story. We started to map um, adenovirus 2 DNA. And in fact, there was a paper that came out on the mapping in which it's the only paper that Phil Sharp and I have in common that we were both authors on that paper. Now, we were looking for things to do with the restriction enzymes in addition to trying to help with sequencing. But my postdoc, Richard Gelinas, came, joined my lab in 1974. I'd met him as a student when we were both at Harvard. I was a postdoc there, he was a student in Fotis Kathartos's lab. And I persuaded him to come and join me at Cold Spring Harbor. And we had this idea, we thought we should try and identify a promoter region in adenovirus, just to see if promoters, the sequences that tell the RNA polymerase where they need to start making RNA, if the sequences were the same in eukaryotes and in prokaryotes. Because in prokaryotes, Mark Potashny, who had really gotten me the job at Cold Spring Harbor, and Wally Gilbert, who shared the prize with Fred Sanger, were working on promoters and identifying promoters in bacteriophages. And so our question was a simple one. Do eukaryotic promoters look like prokaryotic ones? Well, we looked at adenovirus transcription and we discovered that the, or we didn't discover, other people at Cold Spring Harbor discovered that the transcription of adenovirus DNA took place from the very ends. This region E1, which is very close to the left-hand end of the virus, adenovirus is a linear virus, and E4, which is close to the right-hand end. And we thought perhaps what we can do is characterize the very end, the five prime end of the message, and we can sequence that and also sequence the ends of adenovirus. And so we started to sequence the ends upon another postdoc called John Arendt came and worked in my lab and, and worked on the sequencing of the ends of adenovirus. And we thought if you go in far enough, then you're going to see where the transcript starts and we can identify um, what was there. Well, it turned out that program, that, that idea didn't go very well. There was not a lot of early RNA. And so we could never get enough to really characterize the five prime ends. And so we turned our attention to late messenger RNAs. And when it came looking at late messenger RNAs, we discovered that at the five prime end of all of the adenovirus late messenger RNAs, of which there were probably 12 or 15, we didn't know exactly how many at the time, but they all had exactly the same five prime end. There was an 11 nucleotide long sequence, and it was identical in all of these late messenger RNAs. And that's kind of strange. 
Okay, we, we were not expecting it. We were expecting that there were going to be a lot of different ones and that we would be able to map them onto the DNA and work out where they were being coded. So this was very strange. And we then went on and spent a lot of time seeing if we could find where this was coded. Was it coded at the five prime end of every individual messenger RNA or was it coded somewhere else? And I like the idea that maybe it was a primer for RNA synthesis, that here was a specific RNA would hybridize to the DNA and then start transcription. Well, that turned out not to be the case, but eventually I came up with an experiment that showed us what was really going on. <clears throat> and we discovered as a result of that, that in conjunction with Tom Broker and Louise Chow, maybe I should just step back a bit. I, I came up with an electron microscope experiment to test how adenovirus messenger RNA was being made. Uh, neither Richard nor I were electron microscopists. And so we got Louise and Tom involved. They worked just down the lab and they agreed that they would do the experiment for us. And the idea was to make what is known as an R loop. You take an RNA molecule, in this case, an adenovirus messenger RNA, you hybridize it to the DNA under conditions where the DNA has melted slightly. And that can then form a stable structure because DNA RNA hybrids are more stable than DNA DNA hybrids. And we knew that at the three prime end of all messenger RNAs, there was a poly A sequence. And so that would not hybridize, it was put on separately. It wouldn't hybridize to the DNA. But at the five prime end, we were convinced that there was another. Um, piece of RNA that came from somewhere other than the coding sequence right next to the main part of the messenger RNA. And I had an idea about where it might come from, uh, probe DNA, uh, and this was made, um, we thought, by uh, another a separate gene in adenovirus that coded for RNA of no known function. And I thought that might be the source of this oligonucleotide. So anyway, Tom and Louise did the experiment. They saw a structure exactly as we predicted, except that this extra sequence at the five prime end of the RNA was actually composed of two separate sequences joined together as shown right at the bottom. So the two arrows point to the two parts of the DNA that was hybridizing to the end of the RNA, and it was hybridizing at two different positions. And this was the discovery of RNA splicing because we thought if this is happening in adenovirus, which is a typical eukaryotic RNA, then it must be happening everywhere. And of course, as soon as I started to talk about the results of these experiments, everybody discovered it everywhere. One of the interesting things that happened, um, a first one of the first presentations I made was actually at a Cold Spring Harbor symposium. It was an RNA virus symposium and I, told about our discovery. And there, was, there were people who had bought slides to that meeting and had data that they were going to talk about that they could not interpret until they saw this. And as soon as they saw this, they said, oh, now we can interpret the data. And one of those was Mike Bishop, who later got the Nobel Prize with Harold Varmus for their work on tumor viruses. So this was really a very interesting, very great discovery. <clears throat> we published it in Cell. And there was an interesting story I can tell you here. We spent a lot of time thinking about what was the correct way to, uh, what was the adjective that we should use to describe this novel sequencing arrangement that was at the five prime ends of messenger RNA. And I, like the term amazing. I thought everybody who saw it, one of the first things they said, oh, this is amazing. Um, and so we sent in the paper with this title. And there were three reviewers and every single one of them wrote back and said, well, you know, it's a very nice story. This is good. It obviously should be published, but we don't think amazing is the right word to use. Um, you know, this is science. This is not magic or anything like that. And so... <clears throat> 
I called the editor, Ben Lewin, and talked to him about some of the other points that the reviewers had raised. And during the course of the conversation, I said, you know, when you first saw this, what did you think? And he said it was amazing. I said, I rest my case. And so that was how we got amazing into the title of this paper. And to the best of my knowledge, this is the first time that that has ever been used in a scientific paper. And of course, it was a, a very exciting finding. Um, Phil Sharp did it, did made the same discovery separately at MIT. We, we didn't work together or anything like that. He'd left Cold Spring Harbor many, many years previously. And so in 1993, he and I shared the prize, um, the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for their discovery, for the discovery of split genes. And this turned out, <coughs> excuse me, to be incredibly important because if you didn't know that the genes were split, you really could not interpret properly the sequences of any eukaryotic organisms, either viruses, small plants, or even the human genome. You had to know that these genes were split into pieces in the DNA, and then all of a sudden you were able to interpret the data. So that was very nice. <clears throat> In 1993, we in December, we went to Stockholm. And one of the things you have to do when you go to Stockholm is to give a talk um, in front of a big audience at the, um, I, I think it was at the Karolinska Institute. I forget where, where it was given. But anyway, it was a big talk and a massive audience. And my parents were there and it was good. Everybody went. It was great. But mostly, people talk about the work that they'd done to follow up on the prize-winning discovery. I hadn't done that. I had not done very much afterwards. We tried to do some work to set up and understand how the genes got split, how, how the transcription took place, but we didn't get anywhere and we were overtaken by other groups who had better systems. But one of the things we did do in 1992 was to discover base flipping in a DNA methylase. And this was an experiment and a crystal structure that was done by Zhe Dong Cheng, who was a postdoc at Cold Spring Harbor at the time. We had produced um, some very pure HHA1 methylase. This is a methylase that goes with a restriction enzyme, recognizes GCGC. And what we discovered is when this enzyme binds to DNA, it flips the base right out of the helix into a pocket in the enzyme where the chemistry takes place. And this was very exciting because we thought if there are other proteins of which we knew there were many that do chemistry on DNA, on the DNA bases, that maybe they use the same mechanism. And in fact, we now know that that's true. And there are very many examples of base flipping have been discovered um, even in some cases, it's been shown that when transcription takes place, base flipping is also a part of the initial mechanism for starting transcription. Well, I want to go back <coughs> to New England Biolabs and talk about the idea of commercializing restriction enzymes. I told you that Jim Watson wasn't interested and so um, I started looking around and I ran into this fellow, Don Cohn. <clears throat> he had been a, a professor at, or an associate professor at Harvard Medical School. And he was in one of the departments where they never give tenure. And most people go there thinking they're going to be the first person to get tenure. They don't. They leave. They get a good tenured job somewhere else. But Don wasn't like that. He was annoyed. He said he didn't think this was any place, any way to run a university department, not to give tenure to people. And so he said, I'm going to leave, I'm going to start a company, and I'm going to use the profits to support research. And in this way, I'm going to set up Harvard and NIH all in one place. And well, this was pretty much the same idea that I had for the company at Cold Spring Harbor. And he and I just thought along exactly the same lines. And so I said, well, 
I've got all these restriction enzymes. Why don't you start making them? We'll sell them and do exactly what we both dreamed of, start a company and use the profits to support research. Well, I was the fourth employee when I went to see Don. Um, there was he, his wife, and one technician. They were working in a basement in Beverly underneath a hairdressing salon. They had a makeshift lab. They were doing pregnancy tests and a few other things. But basically, um, they were at the very, very early stages of a company. <clears throat> and they had previously been selling one or two reagents through a distributor. Uh, but I convinced Don that we should just do it ourselves. We should just sell them directly to the consumers because I knew who wanted these enzymes. They'd all been visiting my lab at Cold Spring Harbor. And so that's what he did. And the company has been incredibly successful. We're now six, more than 600 people worldwide. We have 100 people doing research, nothing but research uh, in Ipswich, where we're now located. Um, in 1984, we moved out of this hairdressing, the basement underneath the hairdressing salon, put up a new building. And then in 1992, I moved to New England Biolabs as a research director, and I'm now the chief scientific officer there. We put up a new building in 2005 in Ipswich, shown on the right, and things have gone extraordinarily well. And in fact, during the recent COVID pandemic, it turned out that three of the enzymes that we had been making <clears throat> to modify RNA, three of the enzymes to put the cap structure onto RNA, were invaluable for Moderna in making their vaccine. And in fact, we scaled up production of these and all of the Moderna vaccines are made using these enzymes that we had discovered and commercialized at New England Biolab. So for us, COVID turned out to be very good. I want to talk a little bit more generally about the things that I think are really important. I've always been fascinated by puzzles and games. I, I love puzzles, I love games. I like word games, I like mathematical games. I'm not so keen on um, computer games and so on, uh, but some of them are okay. One of my favorite is croquet. And in fact, I spent a lot of time um, playing croquet. I used the Nobel Prize money to put a croquet lawn in front of my house. And I, I love it. What I like about it is it combines the skill of snooker with a strategy of chess. <clears throat> I also um, have a, a dry sense of humor. And I was featured in 1997 as Dr. December in the Stud Muffins of Science. And this was taken on my croquet lawn. Um, so I, I love fun. I, I don't like to take myself too seriously. And I like to make people laugh whenever I can. I also got a number of honors of one sort and another. I was knighted by Prince Charles then, now King Charles III. And that was a very interesting thing. Several um, buildings have been named after me, one at my grammar school that I went to, and one uh, an expansion of the chemistry department at the University of Sheffield. I turned out by chance to be the first student at Sheffield, the first undergraduate, to win a Nobel Prize, so they were very happy about that. I've also been organizing the Nobel laureates for a number of good causes. Um, including gaining the release of some Bulgarian nurses from jail in Libya. They'd been charged totally um, unreliably and with no evidence for spreading HIV in the children's hospital in Benghazi. <clears throat> As a result of that, I um, actually visited Libya, spoke with um, Gaddafi's son, and we were able to get the, the nurses out of jail in Libya. We've done a number of other things too. Um, I organized a big campaign to call for peace between Russia and your country. Um, 203 Nobel laureates signed that petition. We distributed it widely. Um, so far it's not had much effect, but we're hoping that at some point um, we can have some effect there and really help you guys get away from the awful oppression that you're suffering at the moment. I think we all feel incredibly sorry for what is going on in Ukraine. 
And finally, I want to talk to you about the importance of luck. I, I'm probably the luckiest person you know. Um, billiards, when I was a, a, the year that I didn't go to school, that I, I sort of stopped going, I spent a lot of time playing billiards. And I became the West of England junior champion. And I thought I was going to be thrown out of school. And so I went to audition to be a professional billiards player. Um, but I learned probably one of the most important lessons of my life playing billiards. I was in a tournament. I played a shot. I missed the shot I was aiming for, but by luck got another shot and scored. And then when it came to take the next shot, I really didn't pay enough attention. I muffed it and it went away. And an old gentleman came up to me. I was 18 at the time. An old gentleman came up afterwards and he says, you know, if ever you're going to be successful and you can be successful, but especially at games like billiards and snooker and so on, you have to know that when you get a lucky break, you have to take advantage of it. It's no good thinking, oh, you know, I was lucky and it is not right that I should take advantage of it. Everybody has luck and the people who do well in life take advantage of the luck when it comes their way. Kazu Kurosawa, I've already talked about, incredibly important. But by luck, he was in the lab when I was assigned it by my professor of chemistry, probably the best mentor I've ever had. Going to Harvard rather than Wisconsin, that was luck. I thought I was going to Wisconsin. I would have had a good time there, I'm sure, but I would not have met the people that I met um, by going to Harvard. And so that, again, was very important. Looking for eukaryotic promoters in adenovirus 2, we had no idea that eukaryotic promoters um, were going to lead us to discover split genes and RNA splicing. Uh, but we did some experiments. They didn't work. And so we tried to find out why they didn't work. And this leads me to something else that I think is incredibly important. Failure is so important. When people fail at doing things, and especially when they're young kids and their parents think, oh, you know, you failed, you're useless. That's not true. Failure is so important in life. This is when you learn. People who don't fail don't learn. And when you do fail, look and see why and make sure that you understand why it is that you failed. And if you're lucky, it will lead to a big discovery. But probably the earliest, uh, the luckiest thing that happened to me was taking an early plane. You probably remember that in 2001, there were two planes that crashed into the World Trade Towers in New York. The first of those planes was flying out of Boston and supposedly going to LA. I was booked on that plane until two weeks before it took off. And the meeting I was going to got moved forward by one day. And so I took that flight the day before the one that went into the World Trade Tower. That is luck. And that is something that I remember every single day that I'm here because of that very lucky break. And finally, of course, studying bacterial restriction modification systems turned out to be a decision I made in 1972 when I went to Cold Spring Harbor. And that has played so well during my life. First of all, the restriction enzymes allowed me to get involved with New England Biolabs, to use them, to get known by people, uh, we gave many of them away, and so I made an enormous number of friends during those early days. And then we started working on DNA methylases, which is what I'm working on at the moment. And that, too, has been just very, very satisfying um, from a scientific standpoint. <clears throat> we discovered base flipping, and now we know that there are many restriction modification systems but there are many methylases that are not part of them. And those methylases are doing interesting things in bacteria, but we don't always know what they are. So finally, I just want to say that throughout my life, I've always looked at things other than what I'm working on. I read widely, I read books, I 
look at things, listen to lectures about subjects that I'm not necessarily directly interested in, but you just never know when you're going to learn something, read something, find out something that is more interesting than what you're doing, or can help you in what you're doing, can make you look at things from a different viewpoint. And that I think is something that is absolutely invaluable, but it's luck. You go to a lecture, you hear something, maybe you didn't go to know that this was going to change your life, but sometimes it will. And I hope that all of you have the same sort of luck that I've had in my life and that you have a very good career in science and that this awful war stops as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Uh, so Richard, thank you very much for your very interesting lecture about your way from childhood to, to Nobel Prize, about commercialization, and also thank you for your advices. Dear colleagues, maybe you have questions to our lecture, please. Yeah, Maria, oh, please. I seem to have disappeared. No, you're here. Oh, you see me? Yes, yes, everything is okay. Oh, good. Okay. I can't I can't see anybody, but that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Maria, please. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Rich, for your so interesting talk, uh, for your exciting personality that you present yourself in that way that everyone who is listening to is inspired. So thank you so much for that. Um, um, and according to the, the, uh, to the uh, Aaron Cusp license, actually, um, I have a very strange question. Okay. Uh, uh, have you ever um, um, noticed that um, exons and introns change roles? Uh, so uh, that sequences of uh, DNA, uh, which um, uh, which code will do change their role with parts which uh, do not uh, code. If my is is my question clear? Um, um, not not quite. But are you asking whether? Um, no, I, um, I, I, I think I probably didn't. I thought I understood a part of it, but just, um, try, just you had a slide. Yeah, uh, you had a slide uh, where you show um, this mechanism uh, uh, of uh, slicing. Yeah, uh, the green, the green uh, strip do make uh, a circle. Like yeah. it, it do uh, right. Make it does make a loop, and this loop uh, has a sequence yes. which uh, which uh, does not uh, code. Right. So it, um, and it just um, and it just uh, goes away at some point. Right. But so uh, my, in some yeah, cases, but, yes, it goes away, but in some cases, it doesn't. And it turns out that the way that those circles form, um, sometimes they get broken down and just destroyed, but other times they're quite stable. And we happen to know in adenovirus that the very first intron in the leader sequence is quite stable, and we have no idea what it does. It was one of the first circular RNAs ever discovered. Um, I did it. In my, it was discovered in my lab many, many years ago, and we could never work out what it was doing, and so the result never got published. But there is definitely something interesting going on there, and we know that in other cases, these introns, when they come out from the RNA, form circles and do interesting things, or they get degraded, but they're stable. Some portion of them is stable. So mm -hmm. there's a great deal we still have to learn about what happens during RNA splicing, 
and what happens to the intron sequences. We often don't know what they're there for. Uh, if I may to ask you to um, uh, switch one that slide uh, where the picture is. Okay. That was uh, with uh, with a photo of your colleagues who did uh, a microscopical experiment. This one? Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, um, um, just um, what is, um, what my question was, that is if this green loop would uh, appear in a different place, like, uh, can other sequences uh, became that loop? Yes, oh yes, absolutely. There's nothing special about the loop. It's just the region of the DNA um, that is not coding the protein and that it's called an intron and it just gets spliced out. It, it's very much the way, you know, <laughs> if you're making a movie, um, they, they make it a big scene and then they just take little bits and pieces and cut and splice it so that eventually you, you think you're looking at continuous action. And this is exactly the same kind of thing. But when you're making a film, you typically throw away the bits you don't want. Here, sometimes you throw them away and sometimes you don't. Sometimes you keep them. Ah, um, yeah, actually, this why. is exactly uh, uh, what my question was. So is it correct that this loop can appear in any place uh, of uh, uh, RNA. Yes. Uh -huh. um, because um, actually I was wondering if we, uh, if this loop, if this uh, loop will form in a different place of the sequence, maybe it will lead uh, to the change of the biological spices. Yes, so what happens in a, t this is a, a very special case here because the leader sequence, the starting point um, of the messenger RNAs in adenovirus, just um, tells translation where to start. But in a typical eukaryotic gene, there may be 20, 30, 40 or more areas <coughs> where splicing is needed. So there's a little bit of coding region, big region that's not coding, that is this green loop shown here, and then another little bit that codes, and then another bit that doesn't code. And so a typical gene in a human or any eukaryote has many of these loops, many of these regions, which we call introns, that separate the coding region of the messenger RNA. Uh, yeah, uh, then um, does this mean that if we will, uh, if this green loop uh, will appear in different places for two, um uh organisms then it will uh, lead uh, to a split of their uh, properties probably yes yeah this is <laughs> like i see uh, in this i see a connection uh, with a luck oh yes you ended uh, your lecture with the definition like was yes. with importance of luck <laughs> mm -hmm. and um Maybe um, it looks like um, the split of the life way. <laughs> the oh, yeah. change of, of the place of this look, I don't know. Maybe depending of, uh, of one's thoughts, their oh, yeah. uh, RNA will, be, will go in that way or in another way. Yeah, and well, that we're all... All here because of luck. We we call it evolution, but really it's luck. Yeah. So yeah, this is this is amazing. This looks like for me it looks like an um, uh, explanation of the evolution. So yep. uh, 
organism can stay as it yeah. is or it can change a place of intron. <laughs> right. And so what has happened in bacteria that these loops, these regions that don't code for anything have mainly disappeared. So bacteria don't have this. This is something that's very specific for eukaryotes. <clears throat> Okay. Yeah, sign of civilization. Okay. Thank you so much. It's okay. very interesting. Thank you. Yes, and the interesting discussion. So we have also a hand from James Pogrebski, please. Yeah, uh, hello. Um, thank you once again for your lecture you just given. And uh, I have actually a question after the discussion you just had. Yeah. Uh, those introns. Uh, you just mentioned that they, they're basically an evolutionary um, atavism, right? Yes. Yeah. But is it possible for them, or maybe we know some examples, uh, of them actually having some biological role, also some different one? Yes. So the answer is yes. Some of the introns clearly are involved in regulating gene expression. Um, some of them lead to RNAs that have important uses within cells in controlling, say, transcription. But for mm -hmm. the most part, we don't know what they do. So if you were to take the, um, you know, take a typical 100 genes that might have 20 introns in each one, if we're lucky, mm -hmm. maybe two or three of them, we know what they do, and the rest, we don't know what they do. Mm -hmm. This is why it's better to be a biologist than a physicist, because there is so much that we don't know, and the physicists know way too much. It's far easier to find good projects and good questions to ask in biology. Fair enough. Thank you. Uh, also, I want to ask you one more thing in connection to this. Uh, do you think um, there are many theories about how exactly eukaryotic forms were formed and that like uh, and prokaryotic uh do you think that the presence uh, of these loops in one organism and their absence in the other kind of organisms can be connected to that one of them was a predecessor to another and and somehow can we use these loops to try and at least have a theory or a guess of evolutionary pathway? Well, you can certainly have a guess. And I think there are many people who would say that when DNA and RNA and life was first getting going, that you wouldn't have <clears throat> contiguous regions of the DNA that would all make sense and would all code for protein. Mm. And so it may be that this splicing mechanism was something that was very early during evolution, but that now, um, in the case of eukaryotes, they've not been around long enough to get rid of it, or they found uses for it that bacteria haven't. Whereas bacteria, they typically divide and multiply very much more rapidly than eukaryotes. They've also been around longer and they may have found that it was easier just to get rid of these sequences that they didn't want and to get all the coding sequences into one nice pathway. So that's my favorite hypothesis that this is what happened. But there are other people who would argue differently. And the bottom line is, at the present time, we just don't have enough evidence to know which of those might be correct. Well, thank you very much. That's actually very, very interesting. Good. Yeah, thank you, James, for your questions. Dear colleagues, do you have more questions or maybe discussion? Uh, hi. Um, uh, 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 first of all, uh, thank, you, uh, thank you for a wonderful lecture. And uh, my question is, uh, can we say that, that these R, uh, R loops can have a catalytic activity in uh, in the cell? Um, I think if they do, we don't know about it. So I've not, I don't recall having seen any, any evidence in the scientific literature that they have independent catalytic activity. 
Thank you. Okay, thanks. It's not to say they don't, just there's no evidence. So, yeah, Maria again. Uh, yeah, I jump, jump uh, in again um, mm, with a different thematic. Okay. Um, Richard mentioned uh, that um, he promotes um, uh, um, uh, I'm sorry. Um, I was uh, um, I want to speak about um, gene modified uh, products. Mm -hmm. uh, Rich uh, has mentioned that uh, he um, uh, makes a movement to support uh, this uh, DNA modified products, and I want wanted to. to uh, uh, to ask you uh, once again for the for our audience, what are main aspects uh, um, um, which uh, um, should support uh, this gene modified uh, products for the average uh, consumer? Okay, well, so you know what has happened with so-called GMOs, uh, genetically modified organisms is that the people who have been opposed to it tell a lot of and spread a lot of misinformation about what it really is. You have to realize that everything on this planet, whether it's us, plants, bacteria, everything is the result of genetic modification um, over typically millions of years. But we figured out how to do that much more well, much easy, much more easily during the course of the last 30 or 40 years to a point that now using CRISPR methods, the, the so-called CRISPR methods, that we can do it very precisely. We can make very specific deletions of genes that we think are bad, say in a plant, or we can add genes that we think will be very good in a plant. For instance, plants get eaten by insects. If you can put in a gene that is essentially an insecticide into the plant, then the plant can defend itself. And we already know that plants have done this themselves over many, many millions of years. Otherwise, there wouldn't be any plants on this planet. And so the idea that just because we've done it, rather than evolution doing it, is totally mistaken that that is a problem because we can do it precisely, whereas evolution tends to do it in a rather haphazard fashion, that it makes many different things, most of which don't survive and just an occasional one will. But when we do it, we can do it in a way that is very precise where we can know what we're doing. And I always like to use the example of say a, a car. If you have a car with a GPS system in it, and you buy a new car that doesn't have one, how do you get the GPS system into the new car? Well, you don't take the two cars apart and then mix them all up, which is the traditional breeding approach that has led to the foods that we eat. Rather, you just unplug the GPS and put it into your new car. And that's essentially what we do when we genetically modify foods. We take a gene from one place and put it into the plant where we want it. Maybe this gene provides insect resistance. Maybe it makes it produce a bigger yield of what's going on. Um, if it's a, a crop like corn, maybe it will produce bigger ears of corn. And so it makes the land and the plant much more productive. And I think to try to pretend that this is dangerous when all of the science says that is not, I think this is just misinformation that is being spread to the public and is very, very bad. Um, we really shouldn't do it. And Greenpeace, who are one of the big promulgators of all of these myths, should stop. Um, they're really not helping anybody by spreading misinformation about genetic modification. Yeah, I fully agree with you. 
Good. <laughs> uh, uh, first was uh, Mikola Gorabets, please. Uh, hello. Hello. Thank you very much for this amazing lecture. And uh, my question is quite personal. Uh, you have started from puzzles and games, then you decided to be detective. Uh, as I understood, you yes. didn't start the detective career, but you really wanted to do this. And yep. then you changed into chemistry that I fully understand because I'm yep. chemist too. And uh, there was also math. And after chemistry, you became biologist and we won the Nobel Prize. Yes. So what is your next plan then? <laughs> okay, so what I do these days is while it's biology, it's all done on a computer. So what I do is bioinformatics. Um, I spend almost all of my time looking at computer screens, devising programs to study um, DNA sequences and what they're doing. And I'm getting at the moment very interested in artificial intelligence not the sort that I think can be bad, but rather the sort that I think can help us to make great progress in biology. And so that's where I'm heading at the moment is to, to develop a big interest in um, artificial intelligence. But you so should... go on. You're, you're mostly speaking with GPT chat. No, I don't. <laughs> no, I, I call it GPT cheat because... Okay. They, think GPT chat doesn't really tell you what it does. And I think part of the problem is that it's not very good at giving you an honest answer, shall we say. And so I think there's a, there are big problems with AI at the moment uh, because they're using, we call it, they call it generational uh, AI, where it's trying to generate new information, uh, most of which is fictional as far as I can tell. But I think if you train AI programs properly using facts and using things that we know to be true, um, that one can do a lot better with it. And that is how I would like to apply it to biology. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much and good luck. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Yuri Roberts, please. Uh, yeah, thank you for the great talk. It's actually a really fascinating uh, life story. Uh, I, I have two questions. So uh, the first one, I was going. I actually had one question, but now that you mentioned that you're working into bioinformatics direction, uh, can you actually get some insights? What exactly you're doing? Is that something related to the genome annotation, prediction, mutation prediction? What exactly you do? What exactly you're interested in? And second, actually, just a kind of personal question: What made you to move from the academia to? Uh, industry exactly after getting the Nobel Prize. Actually, you were able to stay in academia basically forever. <laughs> well, I, I actually moved one year before I got the Nobel Prize. So I'd already moved up here when, when I won it. And I moved into this particular situation because it feels more like academic than commercial. I, I don't have very much to do with the business per se. Um, I offer advice from time to time, but I, I don't really get involved in anything that's connected directly with making money. I do research. And so all of my time is spent doing research here, all paid for by the company. Now, on the bioinformatics side, what I'm doing at the moment is to look into bacterial, archaeal, viral sequences, looking for restriction enzyme genes and mainly for DNA methylases and then trying to understand where there are DNA methylases that don't have a companion restriction enzyme gene, what are the DNA methylases doing? I think we've already discovered um, that in some cases they are controlling gene expression. In other cases, they shut genes off or shut genes on. And one of the most interesting recent ones was one in Clostridium difficile. There is a methyl transferase. It has no corresponding restriction enzyme. If you knock out that methyl transferase so that it doesn't work anymore, Clostridium difficile cannot form spores. And this could have some very interesting medical applications. 
because Clostridium oh, difficile is a um, in, it's you go to hospital you almost certainly pick it up um, and it can usually not be stopped by antibiotics and it leads to a pretty miserable life if you can't get rid of it and so this offers an opportunity of how you might get rid of it because what C difficile normally does you give it an antibiotic it forms a spore waits until the antibiotic goes away and then it starts growing again um thank you uh and actually thanks for the great products from the NIPU actually to prepare Good. those for, over the term oh, <laughs> we're very happy that you use them thank you James again or not yes thank you uh actually I have a few more questions uh one is you just mentioned that you became interested in artificial intelligence in its application to chemistry and biochemistry. Yeah. And I'm kind of curious, uh, uh, have you heard about uh, molecular assemblies? It's a work by professor from Glasgow, Lee Cronin. Sorry, what's it called? Ha have you heard molecular assembly or molecular, molecular assemblies? Yes, yes, I know about those. What do you think about those? Because uh, I recently listened to a talk by uh, Professor Lee Cronin, and he was talking about its use in chemistry, biochemistry, and that it's his idea works better is on AIs. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Have you asked him, what, 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 do you, what do you think? So I've not used it myself. But my understanding is it's really machine learning rather than AI. And, you know, machine learning is a way of, of kind of doing AI if you don't have a huge amount of data. AI usually typically requires enormous amounts of data. And it's an advantage in the sciences where we typically can provide good um, information for it to learn. But AI, I think, by scanning the scientific literature, in principle, can probably do better. Mm -hmm. That's actually a good point. Thank you. And also, another question I have is, uh, it's more of a fantasy, but still. Uh, That's there okay. was, fantasy is good. The, thank you. <laughs> there, there was a very recent paper published this year by a researcher from Israel, Sasson Shaik, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and they were doing uh, computations, molecular dynamics mm -hmm. of uh, beta amyloid. And they found out that if they apply very strong electric field to a beta amyloid, yep. uh, so basically beta sheet, uh, they're able to destroy the beta sheet structure and just create two, uh, two proteins because they had like beta sheet made out of two, uh, two proteins. And they didn't really talk much about it. And I asked the professor and he also didn't have much of an opinion about that. So I'm really curious in your opinion, do you think that it's possible that some kind of electric field on uh, early Earths, like uh, lightning hitting water or ground or whatever, could possibly influence chemical reactions happening inside cells and therefore influence uh, maybe evolution pathway. Certainly possible. I Whether or not there's any evidence that would support it directly, I'm not aware of, but you could That's imagine it's fantasy. doing it. Yeah, but you could imagine doing experiments to yeah. test that. So yeah, uh, why not? I, I really, I think we know so little about the mechanisms of evolution that almost all hypotheses as to what is the, what are the biggest influences are probably valid at the present time. And, it may be we never know about a lot of these things unless we eventually reach another planet where evolution is at a much more primitive state than it is here. 
yeah and to see how it can progress further yep, right yeah it's very very interesting thank you and probably the last question for me is that, that's just my personal curiosity uh you're a senior and probably like 50 years my senior and i'm really really curious you're, you're still doing science yeah. how do you stay so energetic and passionate about it for so so many years because I love what I do. So, you know, I don't think I've done a day's work in my life, except when I was not doing science. So science is my hobby. I, I just love it. And I think it's also extremely helpful in keeping you young if you exercise your brain regularly. And so I'm, I'm always a little surprised when I see people who retire and don't find something else to really occupy their time in a way that makes the brain function well. So as long as my brain is still functioning, I intend to keep working. And if that happens um, and keeps going until I die, then I guess I'll retire when I die, but only if I have to. <laughs> That's actually a very good opinion. Because, like, you know, you have to keep those neurons firing till they can. You do indeed. Yep. You do indeed. Uh, thank you. Thank nice. you. Nice answer. And we also like uh, our work and science. So, yeah. Yuri, please. Uh, yeah, just one more question. Uh, how was it to work with Frederick Sanger? It was great. So, I'll tell you when I first went over to the MRC lab. Um, I went into the lab, I arrived on a Saturday, went into the lab on a Sunday uh, because I'd been you know, given the, um, the password to get into the building, um, went up to Fred's lab and there was a little old man in there who was busy washing, washing up the dishes. And so I introduced myself and said, you know, I'm Rich Roberts, I, I've come here to work with Fred Sanger. And he looked at me and said, I'm Fred Sanger. So that was our first meeting. I thought he was the janitor, to be honest. But he was he was great. He was very low key. He was not one of these people who is constantly trying to tell you how good he is. And in fact, if anything, he's overly modest. And, you know, he, he would always say, oh, well, I didn't do that. And, you know, somebody else did it when mostly you knew it was him. So. Uh, he, he has been one of my great heroes in science. If I had to find someone to emulate, it would be him. He's, he was just a terrific guy. Thank you very much. Oh, do you still play billiard, by the way? Um, I play pool these days because I don't have a room in my house that's big enough for a full-size billiards table. <laughs> Because, uh, but instead you play croquet. I play croquet, yes. Uh, indeed, indeed, I play billiard starting from uh, 14. In our institution, we have a professional billiard table and queue. Great. So oh, if you will, will visit, come and visit. Yes, if you will visit Ukraine and our institution, so please, Good. we will play billiard here. I will be happy to do that. Very happy to do that. Okay, dear colleagues, uh, I think it's a time to stop our seminar. So thank you very much again for very nice uh, discussion and nice uh, lecture about your way and your advices and uh, be in health, happy and work in science long, long years more. Yes, I certainly hope so. And I, I wish all the best for all of you in the audience. I really hope that this nonsense with Russia stops as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Okay. So see you Thank maybe you. in Kharkiv. <laughs> yes, you will indeed. Bye. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you very much.